All right, let's get started. Uh, so uh, we were going to finish these ones up. Uh, let's go ahead and begin in the whole balancing of reactions. I'll try to figure out a better thing to do with this clock, but that's the only way I can figure out to get a recording clock up. So what I'll be doing as I record, I'll write times. And then when you go to the printed notes, like the handwritten printed notes, you'll see times. If you want to go see that part of the video again, you just scrub over that part of the video. So, I don't know, it might be a better way, but it's not easier, probably. So, All right, so looking at this uh, reaction, this is actually, uh, you're going to learn about these today. They're called combustion reactions. So this is a combustion of ethane, and on the left-hand side, um, on the reactants, uh, this is the ethane. A combustion reaction uh, is when you use oxygen and then it creates heat as it, as it burns, basically. So we call that combustion. Um, I'm going to say, how many, uh, what, do I, what do I want to start with? Yeah, C2H6, so we'll start with this. So that means balance everything on the right with everything that's in that compound, All right? So how many carbons do I need? Two, right? So I'll put two here. And how many hydrogens do I need? Well, I need to have six total, right? So from H2O, how do I get six hydrogens? Use a factor for your coefficient of three, right? So now this is where I would do the little tally thing, right? I'd go like this. Oops, shoot, it's not in the middle, though. This, I do C, do H, and O. I can't even tell. It's supposed to be recording sound, but I don't even know if it is. We'll check it here in a little bit. So then um, I have two carbons. I have six hydrogens. I have two carbons. I have six hydrogens. And now I have to do the oxygens on the right-hand side. I have how many? All right, so this first compound has how many? Four. The next compound has three or seven. So, um, but oxygen on the left-hand side comes as O2, right? How do you get seven from two? What? Yeah, three and a half. Does that make sense? Like, if I need to get seven out of two, this is 3.5, right? Then you use seven halves. Now, a lot of people don't teach it like this. Um, but it, right, it comes as two. If it came as threes, it'd be seven thirds, right? And, and then the, here's the deal. When you balance equations, the coefficients that are in front have to be the smallest possible whole numbers. That makes sense? The coefficients, like the two and the three, those have to be whole numbers. Well, two and three are whole numbers, but seven halves is by definition a fraction, not a whole number. So how do I get seven halves to be a whole number? Multiply by two, right? That'll give me a whole number. So. What you're going to do in a problem like this is you'll drop seven halves in here and say, you know, that's like a part way to the balancing of it. And then you have to double everything, multiply everything by two. And then it'll be balanced with whole numbers. And those will be the smallest whole numbers that you can have. So if I multiply everything by two, I'm just going to rewrite the whole thing. That's 2C2H6 plus 7 O2 makes how many CO2s? Four, right? Four CO2s. And six H2Os. I realize this, and if I touch it with my hand, it really screws stuff up. So I'm going to see if I can drop it way up here. Oh, or not. Oh, that worked. So that's now balanced. And if you're not sure that you did it right, just make the tally again. Count everything up. 
And if it's e if everything's equal to each other, then you're done. Okay. Questions about that? It's like there's something you don't understand. You can ask questions. All right. So I'm going to balance this one. So I think it's like a parent. I'll start with that one. So how many chromiums do I need? How many do I have on the right? I have two, and on the left, the other right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm pointing like this. I really, sh I, it's wrong because like I'm looking at it. I should have been. I don't know. Is it like, am I, I'm looking the wrong way. So, so then I need to have two here. And so this one you can see maybe right away. I have O2, but I need three. So what do I multiply the O2 by? Right. See what I'm saying here? I have, I have this right now. There's only two of them, CR. And O, I have two and two. I have three and two. How do I get three out of two? What? Yeah. Uh, wait. So what? What am I going to multiply? What am I going to put here? How do I get? Three out of two. I multiply by 1.5 or three halves. All right. No. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is just early. I feel like I'm pulling teeth. And so then I get this fraction, and I can't deal with the fraction because we don't like fractions. They always say, "Well, you can't have fractions." The truth is, lots of people balance stuff and they have fractions, like a half or whatever. Um, it's okay, but generally speaking, if you're getting an answer on a test, it's the smallest whole number coefficients. Okay, so multiply everything by two. I have four chromiums, three oxygens, two chromium three oxides, like that, and that'll be balanced. Let me do something really quick. Well, that'll throw people off. That'll be the thumbnail. All right, so next. So this is a continuation of that same set of lecture notes. I uh, edited them and printed out the next pages so you can download them if you want to write into them. Uh, if you have a tablet too, it's a PDF, so um, you can put it onto a tablet and write into it as well. Um, so, this next section is on predicting chemical reactions. And uh, what we'll be doing is, given a set of reactants, you're supposed to tell me what you think the products are. And there are certain ways that we do this. Uh, one of them I've already told you. So, for example, I'm going to say uh, I have C2H6O2. Uh, and we're going to add oxygen to it. And then you have to predict whether or not a reaction occurs. All right. and, and, and this particular kind of reaction is a combustion reaction. So you're going to have to know, like, there's different kinds of reactions. We talked about combustion reactions the other day. It turns out the products of a combustion reaction for hydrocarbons and things with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are with CO2 and water. That's for the, what they call the complete combustion. Okay. So this is what I mean by being able to predict the products. Like combustion reactions is CO2 and water. Okay. How do you know that? I just told you. That's the only way you know it, right? <laughs> When you burn stuff, carbon dioxide and water comes out. If you think about it, when you exhale, what comes out of your mouth? Besides bad breath, we don't go there. It comes out of your mouth. 
carbon dioxide and water vapor. And the carbon dioxide comes from the combustion, basically in your body, the utilization of the sugars to produce energy. So like glycogen, that's actually a polymer of sugars. It's a bunch of sugar mo glucose molecules put together. So like when you're burning glycogen or uh, uh, what's called amylopectin, it's the energy molecule in your body, right? And when you're burning that, you're really just burning sugar. And so when you're burning sugar, it's carbon dioxide and water that come out. So some of that water vapor that comes out of your mouth is not from you drinking. It's actually created in the process of using the sugar to create energy. Okay, okay that's one. Then you have to predict whether or not a reaction occurs. And so we're going to have some rules about when a reaction occurs. But like for a combustion reaction, we're just going to say it always occurs. And how do you know that? Same reason you know what the products of a combustion reaction are. I just told you. <laughs> it, it just happens. So, so you're going to have to predict. So sometimes we have rules. And sometimes it either happens or it doesn't happen. And in this class, we're, it just happens. It's spontaneous, okay, is what we say. Certain types of reactions just happen regardless of what the reactants are as long as they fall in the right class of reactants and they produce and they go through a certain type of reaction. So before we get into the whole predicting thing, okay, we need to talk a little bit about what it means to be soluble. So soluble means homogeneous mixture and or homogeneous and solution. So when you, when you think about a solution, homogeneous mixtures might be things like sodium chloride in water. So NaCl, and then we have the state, so we'll say aqueous. That would make a homogeneous solution. Characteristics of things that are homogeneous, right? Uh, same composition. out right. and in the case of like a little bit of salt in water or sugar in water and you know because you know you can put sugar in water and dissolve it you know you take salt in water and it dissolves right they're going to be clear so if I take food coloring and put it in a glass of water and I stir it up what kind of solution is that Huh? Why would you say that? Ah, see, that's the, there's a difference. This is what I was going after. You put it in there, you stir it around, it's got color in it, right? But you can see it's still clear, it just has a color filter on it now. So, so there's, a, there's a distinction here. When, when things make homogeneous solutions, right, they're clear, but it doesn't mean they're colorless. So you can have color and be homogeneous, or you can not have color, but it's clear, and then color, right, um, how do I want to say this? It sounds weird when I say color is not important. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the whole idea, right? It can have color. So like food color in water, that's homogeneous. Okay. We also say when something makes a solution that it dissolves. So we're dissolving things in. When things dissolve, they're clear, right? And that's a homogeneous mixture. Now, so I'm going to, this is kind of a silly artwork time. So I'm going to have CH2O, and let's just say CH2O looks like this. So let's say that's my CH2O, and I'm going to dissolve it in water. I got to draw a uh, container. Yeah, let's do this. Let's make a container like this. And I'm dissolving it in water. What's it going to look like when the CH2O dissolves? Right. 
and, and this is just to get this idea across, because for molecular compounds, now what I mean by molecular compounds, things like this, this is all nonmetals. When we did our nomenclature, we were dealing with ionic compounds. We were talking about metals and nonmetals together. So I'm talking about molecular compounds like uh, CH2O. That's uh, formaldehyde, by the way. When it dissolves, do you think it looks like... This? Or do you think it looks like there's my water? Like that. Take a vote. How many say this side? How many say this side? I don't know which side is which. Yeah, it's more like this side. For molecular compounds, when they dissolve, all that happens is they get surrounded by water molecules, and they're happy in the water molecules, and they, they float apart from each other. So you could start with a solid or a bunch of liquid, but the molecules themselves stay together. Okay. Now, if I do an ionic compound like sodium chloride, And let's say this is now sodium. And remember, sodium is a positive ion, and chloride is a negative ion. And I put it in the water, right? What happens is the sodium ions and the chloride ions actually separate apart from each other. They dissociate, is what we say, or ionize. Uh, technically, the word dissociate is better than ionize, but we'll go with the, we'll go with whatever people say. So you can have like this. Now it's going to be on a molecular level, roughly uniform, because it has to be electrically neutral at all times. But you'll have an even dispersion of positive and negative ions. So you have in this solution a bunch of negatives. and a bunch of positives floating around each other. And, and this gives the solutions of ionic compounds and molecular compounds really different properties. Okay, Very different properties. I think I talked about it on the end. Let's be on the next slide. So rather than a bunch of, these things would all be, again, these are all neutral. And rather than having a bunch of neutral things floating around solution, you have a bunch of charged things floating around solution. So like technically, if you took a bathtub and you filled it with deionized water, now why do you think we call it deionized water? We took all the ions out of it. We took, like, like normal water has like a little bit of calcium, a little bit of carbonate in it from the air. It actually turns out comes from the air. It'll have other things in it, magnesium, some sodium, some chloride will be in there. Especially if you just get it out of the, the, the groundwater, it's got a lot of ions in it. You stuck your hands in there with a radio, you would get electrocuted. Why is that? Because to, to, to conduct electricity, right, it takes ions that move charge, and these ions that would be in just regular tap water would be enough to conduct electricity, and then you would get shocked. Okay. So, having said that, if you had a non-electrolyte solution, so these, are, these solutions are called electrolytes, or these are called electrolytes. These are non-electrolytes. If you had a non-electrolyte solution 
and you dropped a radio in it, well, if it was perfectly clean and there wasn't dirty or dusty or anything like that, so I wouldn't try this at home kind of thing, you wouldn't get electrocuted simply because there's not enough ions in the solution to conduct electricity. But of course, you know, you have salt all over your skin. I don't know if you know this. You stick it in there, you probably get electrocuted, I'm just saying. But in, in theory, like in theory, a lot of things are really cool until in practice you kill yourself. Okay, So that's just, I'm just telling you that. So electrolytes, right? Electric current can be carried in water if it has charges in it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so then we call these things electrolytes. So electrolytes produce ions, charges in water. So that's why, you know, they tell you, oh, you need your Gatorade. Why do you need your Gatorade? You don't really need Gatorade, but let's pretend you did. Most of the time, people need Gatorade because they just want sugar. But like, you know, in the early 70s, uh, Florida Gators, the football team, they started drinking this salt mixture so to improve their performance on the field because in Florida, I don't know if you know what it's like, but it's super humid. And they got sweaty out there and they would drink Gatorade to re replace their electrolytes. Why do you need it? Why do you need electrolytes? Do you have electricity in your body? Answer is yes. Your nerves need electricity need electrolytes to conduct electricity for all those action potentials. And all your cell membranes have a, an electric potential on them. And so you need electrolytes to maintain that potential. So you do need some, like just most people get way more than they need. Okay, there's um, also things we call non-electrolytes. Non-electrolytes will dissolve, but not produce ions. And as a result, a solution of non-electrolyte can't conduct electricity. Now, we're talking about this like we're really interested in, in conductivity and stuff like that. I'm kind of interested in that. But we're really interested in characterizing compounds better based on whether or not they break up into ions or not. Okay. Okay, so um, <laughs> I, I wrote myself a note. Draw light bulbs to indicate. So we're talking about strong electrolytes. Let me list the things that are strong electrolytes. Soluble ionic compounds. So like sodium chloride is ionic, metal, non-metal. Put it in water, you know it dissolves. And, and so that means when sodium chloride dissolves in water, it's forming cations and anions in the water. But there's a lot of things, okay, and we'll talk about how you know. There's a, this is one of those rules that you're going to have to be paying attention to. A lot of rules on, on determining whether or not something's soluble or insoluble. The other kinds of things that, that are strong electrolytes, okay? Oh, if a substance dissolves to form a lot of ions per mole, this is strong electrolytes. Those things are the soluble ionic compounds. We'll often say soluble salts meaning they dissolve in water, and the strong acids. And really what it means to be a strong acid is that it breaks up to form lots of ions. So you guys have the green sheet that I gave you the other day? Oh, she has it right in front of me. You're so cool. Let me just grab it. 
Very tight So look on the back side, the holes on the right. This list of strong acids. There's also a solubility here. So the strong acids are things like HCl, H, oh, HCl, HBr, HI, then HNO3, H2SO4, HClO4. Those are the strong acids. I may have missed one on there, but I think that's most of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that's about right. So actually what the strong acid, what sodium chloride does, and you put it in, in water, you take Na and Cl, and you make it aqueous, what that actually is is sodium ions in solution and chloride ions in solution. Okay. And in that process of forming the ions, right, it dissolves. That's what's happening when it like, disapp disappears into the solution. HCl, on the other hand, dissolves regardless of whether or not, but it forms H plus, and I'm going to do this. Remember what that means. That's aqueous plus Cl minus. Does that. And every mole of substance you put in breaks up and forms ions. So if I put one mole of HCl in solution, I would actually have a mole of hydrogen ions and a mole of chloride ions. I don't actually have any HCl left when I put HCl in solution because it completely ionizes to form the hydrogen ion and the chloride ion. Sodium chloride, when I take NaCl and I put it in water and I stir it around, there's no NaCl, NaCl left in the solution. It's all sodium ions and chloride ions, and they're all floating apart from each other. Okay. I think I gave the analogy of going to Disneyland. You go to Disneyland with all your friends and you stay with your friends. That's a molecular compound. You go to a rave, you're with all your friends, but you're not really with all your friends. You're just with a whole bunch of people right, that you don't know. And that, that's what these guys are doing. They're just floating around with a bunch of sodiums and chlorides they don't know. So these are known as strong electrolytes. And when you put them in water, they completely dissociate. And then there are things that are called weak electrolytes. It only forms a few ions per mole, so we call that a weak electrolyte. Those are things like HF. That's hydrofluoric acid. The things that go under this category are the weak acids and weak bases. So when I take HF and I dissolve it in water, in the water I have mostly HF and I have a few hydrogen ions and a few fluoride ions. About 1% of HF will ionize in water, which means like HCl, when I put it in water, it's 100% ionized. It's 100% hydronium, hydrogen ion, sorry, and 100% chloride ion. HF, it's 1% hydrogen ion and 1% fluoride ion. It's a weak acid because it doesn't dissociate well and doesn't produce a, 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 a lot of ions. So, how do you know what the strong acids are? be like the third time I say this today because I just told you yeah that's the only way you know it's on that list okay so you have to memorize the strong acids it's not too bad the strong acids are right chlorine the one the hydrogen compounds of chlorine bromine niobene and then it's sulfuric acid and perchloric acid oh. oh oh and nitric acid did I put nitric acid on there HNO3 yeah yeah so it's not that bad, um, but you do have to know what those are. So how do you know if it's a weak acid? If 
be a fourth time I told you. Because I told you what the strong acids are. Everything else is weak. Okay. So the weak acids, you know they're weak acids. They have a hydrogen in the front, and it's not one of the strong acids. So that's how you know it's a weak acid. You know it's a weak acid. Right? I'll write it out. If it's not on the strong acid list. So, for example, the, a real common one is acetic acid. Right? How would you know that that's a weak acid? Because it's not one of the six that I told you is a strong acid. That's the only way you know. Now, substances that dissolve but don't form any ions, these are non-electrolytes. And prim primarily, these are molecular compounds. So what is it? All nonmetals. Now that's not including the strong acids and the weak acids. The strong acids and the weak acids are all molecular compounds too, it turns out. But other than the strong acids and the weak acids, there are things like sugar. The formaldehyde is the one I gave you earlier, CH2O. Uh, methanol, CH3OH, that's also, you know, it's all nonmetals. It's not an acid. How do you know it's an acid, by the way, right? Let's go back to that. How do we write the formulas for acids? Look up there, how, they, how were they all written? Yeah, I got the H at the very beginning. Those are the only compounds that will have hydrogen in the beginning. So if you see an H in the beginning, you know it's an acid, and then you just have to remember, is it strong or is it weak, okay? So my little light bulb thing was going to be like this. So if I had a strong electrolyte, right? I'm going to draw my light bulb. Now let's see. I guess I'll do it. Like that's black. But here's my light bulb. Is it? Well, that's not bad, actually. Sorry. And then uh, let me duplicate it. can't get to copy. Copy. Hmm. I think I need a keyboard for this. All right. That's okay. I'll just draw it over. So if I have a strong electrolyte and I, and I take wires and I connect it to a solution and a battery, like I have a battery here. I'll see if I can get them to pull the, the uh, demo out. I just didn't have time to do it wires go better. So this is how they actually do this demo. They'll take a wire and they'll take a wire to here. So I don't know if you know the, the old light bulbs have two leads on them. And the bottom thing is one of the voltages and the side thing is another voltage. And so maybe you don't know how these work but then what they'll do is they'll take a battery. Now in the, in the old school, uh, that's a DC battery, but in, in the old school we would just plug it into a wall. And then we would take these wires and stick it into a beaker like that. So 120 volts, sticking two, electro, two wires into a solution with a light bulb on it. And if it conducted electricity, what would happen to the light bulb? It lights up, right? And so when you do like a strong electrolyte, what do you expect? You expect a lot of light to come out of it, right? And that's actually, like, if you don't know whether or not something's strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, non-electrolyte, they used to make solutions and stick these electrodes in it. And they used to measure the electric current that would go through there. And in schools, right, we, we just looked at the amount of light that would come out. I have a demo somewhere. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, 
At City College, I had like a Frankenstein switch. The light bulb would light up, or it wouldn't light up. A weak electrolyte would be like this, and a non-electrolyte would just be no light, completely off. Which gives me the you know, get, that's where I get the idea. If, if you had a radio in there and your hands were in there, yeah, you wouldn't get electrocuted. But like I said, don't try that at home. Yeah, so I'll see if we, uh, he has a demo, but it's a little fancier here. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at the solubility rules, get the green sheet out. And, and we're going to figure out uh, which of the following substances will dissolve in water. So what you're going to do first is these things and all of these things, you generally look up the ion. On the anion. So we're looking at sodium chloride. Or not sodium, but silver chloride. So look up chloride on the solubility rules. And what does it say about chloride? And where did you find it? I saw some solubility rules in here. This is actually mine from last year. That? It says chlorides. Now you'll notice, like on the top, this is another version of the same thing you have. On the top, it says compounds containing the volume following are generally soluble. Is that where you find the chlorides in that packet list? But then you look at it and you look over to the right, and what do you see? You see AG exceptions. So if it's generally soluble, what that means is it's AQ. Generally soluble means it's aqueous. And if it's an exception, then it's not soluble. Does that make sense? Generally soluble means aqueous. But if it's an exception, then it's not aqueous. And we would just say it stays as a solid. So you fill in the state. AgCl in water would be a solid. So like the molecular pictures, the draw a molecular picture of the solution, uh, when, the solu when the soluble compounds dissolve, you wouldn't draw one because it doesn't dissolve. It'll just all sit in the bottom of the beaker. If you took silver chloride and you threw it in water and you stirred it around, it'd be cloudy for a while, then all that cloudiness would settle to the bottom. And if you held it to the light, it would turn purple. Cool, actually. Sorry. Okay. So calcium chloride, is calcium an exception? No, because it's not on a list, right? There's only a few of them that are listed. There's, there's uh, bro, uh, silver, uh, mercury, and lead. So anyways, that's what you have. So, so that means this will be aqueous. So like in solution, actually, let me just draw panels. I'll do it like this. Right. So there's there, there, like the one on the left, just, just for funds. Sorry. Can I say that? Is that allowed? Say it's for funds. I mean, I grew up in Reedsley. It seems like it's okay. It would just be like that. A bunch of, it's all clumped up at the bottom. So it's still solid. For calcium chloride, I'll use blue for the cations. I'd have, I'd have, again, these are solutions. I'd have calcium. How many chlorides do I have to draw now? Four? Two? Two per, right? And they'd be like this. I mean, to make it like close to being right. They're all separated out from each other. So this is a, a, an electrolyte solution. You have positives and negatives, all right? And it would conduct a lot of electricity because you got a lot of ions that formed per mole. 
and just a little key that's negative. And this is positive. Okay. Okay. Silver nitrate. Oh, I didn't need the parentheses. That's a typo. It's this. Get rid of that. And calcium nitrate's this. It's got a three and a two. Let's zoom it just a little bit so you can see it. Silver nitrate. What do we know about nitrates? Hmm. What's it listed as? What are nitrates? This is the NO3 minus. What are the nitrates? You find it? What is it? Generally soluble or generally insoluble? Yeah, or always soluble? They're always soluble because there's no exceptions, right? So nitrates are always soluble. So the nice thing to know is if you see a nitrate, right, it's always going to dissolve. And chemists use nitrates all the time in labs because they always dissolve. I want that dissolved. I'll get a nitrate, and it'll be great. Actually, you know why uh, chemists like nitrates? Because they're better than the day rates. Oh, it's funny to me. It's all that matters. So um, when silver nitrate, now you can think about that all the time. It's going to be hard to avoid. Dissolves in water, right? I'm going to have positives. And I'll have negatives. How many negatives will I have? I'll have one for each, right? Because even though I, drew the, I wrote the formula wrong. I'll do something like that. Both of these are electrically neutral because remember, calcium is a two plus charge, so you have to have two minuses with it. Silver is a one plus charge, so you have to have one minus with it. What about calcium nitrate? It. Soluble because it's a nitrate, right? So if I was drawing that out, that would look a lot like calcium chloride would. So these are both, oops, I didn't mean to do that red. These are both aqueous. That. Now let's just pretend I drew it, but it'll be exact. I don't know, I'll draw it. I'll draw it. Just trying to be lazy. I'm good at it. Do something like that. So soluble makes a lot of ions. Okay, so I'm gonna try try this mind to game with you, right? So like, let's just say, looking at these middle two solutions, right? So the, this solution here and this solution here. And let's just say I remove that. Take the wall out. So literally I do that. What's going to happen? What will the two solutions do? Do they each stay on their own side and go, no, I'll go on that side. What happens? They'll start to mix, right? So now what's going to happen? I'll have, these are the chloride ions, right? I have chloride ions in solution. And these are the silver ions in solution. And what does that combination want to do? What did we find out over here? It's not soluble, right? It'll want to form solid, and that's exactly what it'll do. It will precipitate out of the solution. So if I take these two solutions that are completely clear and I mix them together, all of a sudden they'll be completely cloudy. And the cloudiness will be the, so, the silver ions finding the chloride ions in the solution and then the whole thing just precipitates out. You get a whole bunch of solids down at the bottom. Over time, it'll all settle out. Okay, so that, that's an important thing to sort of conceptually understand. 
I meant to write the time, so we're at 30, 30, oops, let me do that, 37, 11, cool. So this is how we're going to do, we're going to, um, there's just a lot of space at the bottom of this slide. These are, we're going to use solubility rules to help us predict whether or not a reaction takes place between two ionic compounds. So we're going to make solutions of two ionic compounds. We mix them together, and we're going to try to use solubility rules to help us understand whether or not precipitation will occur, or otherwise whether or not a reaction will occur. So the first thing to do is you have to write out the reactants as ions. Now, I'm assuming you wrote all the reactants correctly, and then you write out the reactants completely as ions. This is what we're going to do. And then we're going to do what's called the double replacement reaction. Remember we talked about double replacement uh, the other day? It's when you go to a party with a friend, and they go to a party with a friend, and you leave with each other's friends instead. Yeah, that's the double replacement. My wife came up with that analogy. I'm like, what did you do before you met me? I'm just saying. Holy cow. Sorry. Little uh, little drama with my mom. Hang on, I gotta I gotta make sure everything's okay. All right, sent a message. So um. So then you write out the products using the double replacement. Uh, and you, what you're going to be doing is you'll be predicting the formulas based on the ion charges. And then you'll use solubility rules to figure out whether or not solids form. If a solid forms, then a reaction takes place. And then you can balance it. You do all that good stuff. Okay? You balance it and write a bunch of other things out of it. So what I'm going to do is actually we're going to do three examples over the next three pages. <laughs> it takes a while to do some of these things, so we're just going to do it. Okay. So can I move on? I'll leave it up there for a little bit. So calcium nitrate and sodium carbonate. So first step is we're going to break up the reactants into their ions. So first step, I'm going to break those ions in. So um, what's the calcium ions charge? Right. We're going to write out calcium, we're going to write out nitrate. I'm not, I'm not writing the subscripts, I'm just writing the ions. But I don't have the charges, so somebody's got help. Two plus for the calcium, because it's group two on the periodic table. And the nitrate's minus one, because you memorized it last week. That was yesterday. You can do it. Hey, by the way, I put up a nomenclature quiz that I stole from somebody else. You can just take it as many times as you want. It's for practice, and every time you do it, you'll get different ones, okay? And it does acids. It does bases, I think, even. It does transition metals. It does non-metals. It does it just straight ionic compounds. It has a whole bunch of them. All right, what's sodium ion? Charge. Plus one, so it's Na+. Plus. And then what? I have carbonate. So carbonate is? 2 minus. Because if the sodium is um, plus 1, and there's two of them, then it's got to be 2 minus. Okay, let me just ask you something really quick, okay? Um, does it bother anybody that I didn't include that? 
I mean, a lot of people will write that as part of the ion. It's not part of the ion. It's part of the formula that tells you how many of those ions there are. But a lot of people want to keep the subscript too. It especially happens on things like CaCl2. And when they break it up, they'll say, well, it's Ca2 plus and Cl2 2 minus. They'll do that. Okay. But there's only, right, the subscript's only here because you have two of those guys. So I don't want you to get confused by that, but that's a common like point of confusion for me. That subscript stuff. Okay. So now I'm going to predict the new products. Now the double replacement, we're going to go like this goes with this, and this goes with that. So we're going to predict the products. This is step two. That's kind of like you're doing the foil method without the first and the last. It's the insides and the outsides that you're putting together. You guys remember what foil is? First, outside, inside, last? I mean, I still remember that, and that was like, I don't know, we barely invented rocks. I think it was a long time ago. I used to tell the kids it was before they invented color. And they're like, what? No. We've always had color. <laughs> What's that? Well, those are both positively charged, right? And, and they'll repel each other. So for ions, it's always opposite charges have to get together. So the calcium only has choices of going with nitrate or carbonate. And it was already with the nitrate, so now it's going to go with the carbonate. Okay. So we're going to get something that looks like Ca and CO3. So that's a 2 plus charge and a 2 minus charge. So what happens? They just, they, yeah, they, they go together. I'll get a... a get one thing like CaCO3. And for the sodium and the nitrate, right, what's going to happen? It's one sodium and one nitrate. That's all I need. So it'll be NaNO3. So the next thing to do is to look at the states. So I'm going to rewrite the whole thing, actually. So I have, because we're going to have to write it out with the states and balance it. So it's CaNO32. I'll need a state in here. Plus uh, Na2CO3, and I'll need a state in there. And then it's going to make uh, CaCO3. And that'll need a state. And then I'll have NaNO3. And I, I can zoom it and do like that. NaNO3. And I need a state in here. So we're mostly worried about the products right now. So somebody look up carbonates and somebody look up nitrates. Oh, we all know the nitrates. So everybody look up carbonates. What are nitrates? Chemists like them. They're always soluble, not because they're better than the day rate. So we'll put AQ in here. That's going to take a while to get used to, by the way, because when you say soluble, you automatically think S, but that means solid in the, in this, in the face language. So, carbonates. Where do you find the carbonates? Generally not soluble, right? Is calcium a exception or anything? So you'll find it in the green sheet under the generally insoluble. So it's a solid. So right now, at this point, I know a reaction took place. We're going to go ahead and look up the states for the reactants. Uh, calcium nitrate will be, uh, sorry, aqueous. Oh, I did it. Yes. And sodium carbonate. Now, here's another thing to remember. Group one is always soluble, no exceptions. Except for one that I can think of, but that's okay. There's one. All right. So what is that gonna be? It's gonna be aqueous. 
Now, if you want to balance this, I'm going to go ahead and balance it. I'm going to put a two over here. That'll balance the whole thing out. But we would balance it. Like the fourth step is now that we've determined the states, we figured out a solid is formed. And then the last step is we're going to balance it. All right. I'm going to let you practice with this one, but you'll notice I wrote them out like this. So write out the formulas, right? And then write out the ions. Or you can write the ions and the formulas, it doesn't matter. And predict the react. You know what the reactants are, predict what the products are. And then I'm going to get some more green sheets because I don't think everybody has it. Right now we're at 48. Let's print some more up for the fall. I think I printed up like 400 of them for this last fall. Okay, so uh, lead to nitrate. What's the formula? PB NO3 2, like that. And it, the ions are just while we're here, it's lead 2 plus and nitrate like this, right? And then hydrochloric acid is HCl, yeah. Now, that's H plus and Cl minus. What are my new products? So I'm gonna go like this, right? The outside and the inside. 
Now, the cation is always written first, so I usually start the air at the cation. It's just like a mental thing. I'm going to have PB Cl2, and we're going to need the state for that. And then we're going to do HNO3. And we'll need a state for that, and I'll have to talk you through that a little bit. Oh, shoot, I'm at the edge of the page. I wrote big this time. Okay, and then we'll do the states for the reactants as well. And then we'll balance it. So, nitrates, aqueous. Chlorides are generally aqueous, except, except for lead. Yeah, so that's a solid. HCl is also aqueous. And then HNO3 is aqueous. Now, the reason HCl and HNO3 are aqueous is because they're acids. All the acids we deal with in this class are soluble. Not all of them ionize. Weak acids don't and strong acids do. So you just got to keep that in mind. And if you want to balance this, guess somebody can get there. It's going to be, you'll need two of these. And I'll, need two of these. Okay. And I'll you know, you can practice these again and you can do the balancing. We did a lot of that yesterday and today. All right. So sodium hydroxide and iron three chloride. What's sodium hydroxide? Okay. It's Na plus and OH hydroxide is OH minus. That's one of those ones you're supposed to memorize just because it's not on the chart anywhere, right? It's just one of the ones you're supposed to memorize. Um, and then iron is Fe. 3 plus, right? And chloride is Cl minus. I tried to reuse a lot of the ions in here so there wouldn't be a lot of questions about that. Okay. Now, my reactant sodium hydroxide is one of these and one of those, right? So I'm going to write NaOH. And I'm going to write iron chloride. We'll need a state for that. Iron chloride will be FeCl3. What are my products? Right, so I'm going to do the sodium with the chloride and then the iron with the hydroxide. We got a product? What? NACL. Yay! Oh, it's zero sugar? Cherry? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was cherry. That's okay. No. I'll still drink it. It's diet. It'll counteract the donuts I had last night. Sorry. No carb. Was a baseball practice yesterday around 8 30. I was feeling like dizzy. Um, dang. And I realized, oh, I didn't eat lunch. A long day. And like, so I had breakfast at 8, uh, 7 15, 7 30. And I went all day and I didn't eat food and I didn't drink water. And it turns out by 8 30 in the evening, you're usually pretty tired and dizzy. <laughs> I'm just like, so I'm driving home, like, I'm so hungry, I gotta eat something. And there's donuts to go. It was like glowing in the night. So I got beer rocks and I bought donuts for everybody at home, but probably could have made a better decision. Not for my soul, but I could have made a better decision. All right. And then the pro other, other product, Fe, OH, three like that, right? And then we'll need a state for that one too. So um, NaOH?
soluble. Because group one, sodium ions are generally soluble. Hydroxides are generally insoluble, but the exception is the group one. So you got to be careful. Sometimes when you read the rule, you don't see it because it's just referencing everything in group one. So that is soluble, so it's AQ. Iron chloride? Chlorides are generally soluble. So iron is not an exception, so that's AQ. Sodium chloride, well, some of them you just know. Salt is soluble. And iron hydroxide, solid. Okay. And then you could balance that. I'm thinking like that. So far, so good. So um, what I want to do here, because normally I wait a little longer to take a break, I'm going to go ahead and take a break for about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and get back at it. So there's a couple other kinds of uh, reactions that we, uh, uh, representations of chemical reactions that you have to know. Uh, what we just did is what we call the molecular equation. Just predicting the product and writing the reactants and products and balancing and that kind of stuff. Um, then there's what they call the complete ionic equation. I'm going to try to do this and be able to see it. Let's see. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to drag it down. But I thought it would be easy to copy. Let me see how I do this. Because it seems to me like I should just be able to copy it, duplicate. There we go. And I got to drag it down. Oops. Well, that didn't work out so good. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, well. Nothing's perfect. All right. Well, oh, I didn't leave a lot of room there. I thought we'd be able to see it from up there, but you can't quite see it. I'm just going to make a little note over here. Put it up here like that. Okay, good. Um, so this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to write everything that says aqueous next to it as ions. So we balanced it. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that first reaction for reaction, what I call reaction one, and we're going to write everything that's ions, aqueous as ions. And then strong acids will split apart too. So for, for that reaction, I have calcium nitrate, right? So in the, in the molecular equation, I wrote calcium nitrate as a formula, but in the complete ionic equation, or sometimes they'll call it the total ionic equation, you write it out as separate ions. So you go calcium, 2 plus. And now you're supposed to write aqueous. I'm just going to do that. Plus 2 nitrates. Plus 2 sodiums. Plus carbonate makes now calcium carbonate is a solid so you just leave it together and then you're going to write the sodium nitrate out as two sodium ions plus two nitrate ions and those underlined, squiggly underlined ones are all aqueous. You know, it's like the subscripts on the nitrates, uh, other than the three there, but the, the two that I have from, for, the, for the reactant, that went away. The subscript for the sodium and the product went away, or the reactant went away as well. Now, what we're going to do from this is we're going to actually write something called the net ionic equation. 
So when you get all that copied, everybody okay got that copy? I'm gonna originally meant to just scroll this thing up. Almost fits, there we go. So we're gonna get rid of what we call the spectators. So like if you go to a, a football game, who are the spectators? Where are they at? The people watching, right? And pretty much they're not doing anything other than yelling at the referee usually. So who's the spectators in reaction? Who are the spectators in reaction one? Who didn't do anything? There's actually two of them. The nitrate and sodium. Because you'll notice that the way this is done, right? There's the nitrates there, they're over here. They didn't change from beginning to end. There's nothing that happened. And then for the sodiums, there's two sodiums here. There's two sodiums here. So those are known as the spectators. And what we're gonna do is get rid of the spectators and write what's known as the net ionic equation. So underneath this reaction, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna get rid of this one. I'm gonna get rid of this one. I'm gonna get rid of this one, and that one. And that leaves the calcium, the carbonate, and the calcium carbonate. So I'll write it as Ca2 plus. That's aqueous. Plus CO3, 2 minus, makes CaCO3. And that's solid. Solid and liquid, those end up show up so few times, I just, I write the states for those. But for, for aqueous, you have to write that so many times, I just use the squiggly line. You could fit a lot more in that way, too. All right. So the total ionic equation shows everything that's aqueous and the strong acids as ions. And then the net ionic equation, I just give, I only show the stuff that changes. I only show the stuff that changes. And, and the reason we like net ionic equations is it's really clear to see what's happening in the solution. Because all the sodiums are not doing anything, all the nitrates are not doing anything, but these are the things that are doing things. And so it helps us to identify what's actually happening in the solution. Okay, I'm gonna pull in Go back up here. I'm gonna fill these back in because I actually tore them out. I'm gonna steal this one up here. Oops, didn't mean to do it like that, huh? Let me just duplicate it here and drag it back in place. Yeah. A little clunky. I might have to use my keyboard or something. I'll shrink it down. This is just for reference. You should have it on your page somewhere. Okay, and I'll zoom back in so it's a little bit bigger. So, what I want to do is write the total ionic equation, and from that, I'm going to do the net ionic equation. Right. So uh, lead nitrate, right? It's aqueous. So I'm going to write that out as ions. HCl is a strong acid. And I only know that because I memorized it back in the Stone Age. 2H plus plus 2Cl minus. Those are aqueous. And then you write the products out and then I'll, uh, I'll write them out. Too. I won't say them as I do them so that you can do them and then look up and see if you got it right.
You get that? Little victories. Who didn't get it? Or is getting this stuck? Okay, everything that's you write that's salt aqueous or strong acid, you split it up into its ions, you write it all out. Now, we're going to do the net ionic equation. And which ones am I going to get rid of? Yep, nitrates. And the hydrogen ions, right? Like that. Yeah, and so my net ionic equation will be lead and the chloride and then the lead chloride solid. So I'll write PB2 plus plus Cl, two Cl minuses make PBCL2, like that. The last one I'll let you do all on your own. Let me copy it down so you can see it. And I'll come around and help you guys out if you need the help. Um, let's see. I need to copy it and all that stuff. So go ahead and write the total ionic equation. I try to zoom it in, make it a little bigger. Let's see it. Go ahead and write the total ionic equation and then do the net ionic equation underneath there. Chemistry's not spectator sport. I thought it was so funny when I was typing, like, I typed it in there. Yeah. Spectator ions. Yeah. It's true that you can't just sit around. All right. I'll write it out here and let's just see. You'll just be able to see if it's right. Ah, 
zoomed. Alright, is that what you guys got? Okay, good. And then I gotta get rid of what? If I'm gonna do the net iac equation, what goes away? And a and CL. And then I'm left with doesn't matter the order. Um I personally like to write the cation first just because um, that's the way it is in the formula, but nobody cares. I shouldn't say it that way. Somebody probably cares. It's just not me. So that'll be the net, net ionic equation. So, summarizing, right? If it's a a double replacement reaction, right, with two ionic compounds, uh, and it forms a solid, we call that a precipitation reaction, and we know the product, the reaction will take place. We predict the products by taking the reactants and writing their ions out and seeing what the products are, right, and then we check their states. Uh, other than that, and then there's that total ionic and net ionic. So now we have to talk a little bit about neutralization reactions. And, and here's the thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go back up here because probably a lot of people didn't see this. This falls all under the category double replacement reactions. So the types of reactions that you'll predict are combustion, which is CO2 and water as the products. And then there are all these different kinds of double replacement reactions. Okay, so... If the double replacement reaction is between two ionic compounds, then we're looking for precipitation as a product. Now, acid-base reactions are also double replacement reactions, but the only difference is instead of two ionic compounds, you have an acid and a base. Okay? And the product, the process that we use for predicting the product is exactly the same. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So, sodium hydroxide, right? It's made up of sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And sulfuric acid is made up of what? What's it made up of? Sulfate, right? and hydrogen. So it's going to be H plus. And then there's a couple of ways this can be done. I'm going to go ahead and assume it's like this, SO42 minus. Those are the ions that actually make it up. Okay. So it's the acid and the base. The acid gives up hydrogen ion and the base gives up hydroxide. And then we're going to do a double replacement. So in the double replacement, it's the H and the OH go together, and the Na and the sulfate go together. So I'll have Na what? 2 SO4, like that. Right? And then I'm going to have, what's the other product? Water. A lot of people say HOH, and they're like, what's HOH? I don't know. H2O. And, and here's the thing about uh, acid-base reactions is they always happen. So there's not a prediction. It's like combustion. You do combustion, you know it's going to happen. You write carbon dioxide and water, and then you balance it. If it's acid-base, you're always going to write a product. And, and balance it. You just, it always happens. So there's no predicting in that sense. You just have to know. So the state for H2O is going to be a liquid. And the state for um, 
Na2SO4 will be aqueous, the sodium. NaOH is also aqueous. And sulfuric acid is also aqueous. Now, I didn't use a sol I use solubility rules for sodium hydroxide, sodium sulfate. I use solubility rules for that. Acids in this class are always soluble. Okay, so write that little note. Acids are always soluble. class are all soluble. But like as soon as you get to organic chemistry and you get beyond like three carbons or four, five carbons really, then they're all insoluble. In water. And then like the difference in organic chem versus here. Well here we're talking all about aqueous stuff and like an organic chem it's mostly non-aqueous so we do stuff like in organic solvents and a lot of the uh, acids are not soluble in those either. They're just hard to dissolve, depending on how many carbons and stuff. They're usually too polar for a lot of organic solvents. Okay. Um, yeah. So now I'm going to write the total ionic equation. So sodium hydroxide is aqueous. So I'm going to write NaOH. And then. Um, you know, I didn't go to the solubility rule. I just know it's soluble. I'm just going straight to that. Okay. And then I'm going to have, this is a little bit tricky, um, but I'm going to have to explain this to you now. H2SO4, only the first ion, only the first hydrogen ion is strong. And the second one is not. So what that means is the strong acid, you break it up into H plus into its anion. Its anion is HSO4 minus. And these are all aqueous like this. Okay, and then it goes off to this and a 2Na plus. So this is this is like a, a little weird thing. This is just sulfuric acid that's this way. Only first H plus separates. And then I have um, H2O. There's actually two of them. Well, let me just do H2O. Like that. And that's a liquid. Now, this one comes out weird when you do it that way. Uh, you know what I forgot to do? Is um, balance this part up here. There's two of these here and two of these here. That means there's two here, two here, two here. Yeah, so don't forget to balance, otherwise all of a sudden you get to the end and go, that stuff's not canceling out. It only cancels if you balance it. Okay, now what happens? Can you get rid of some spectator ions? What's the spectator? Just the sodium, there's just a one in this reaction. So now you're gonna write the net ionic equation, right? Two OH minus plus H plus plus HSO4 minus make, oh, I forgot my sulfate, didn't I? 
I meant to do this. I'm sorry. When I said only uh yeah, SO4 SO42 minus that. Plus uh, SO42 minus plus 2H2O liquid. And these are all, all the ions are aqueous. Okay, we'll do one more. I think we just have one more. Yeah, just the one more. So this is what I want you to do. Predict the products and then balance it. It's not going to take the hard to balance this one. And then write the complete ionic and the net ionic. And I'll just make the little side note here. HF is weak. you get his products? Did you guys get there? Not get there? Can you get there? Okay, so let's do this again. H plus, F minus, K plus, and then this whole thing is OH minus. So what are your products going to be? K and F and H and OH. Um, <clears throat> HF, as far as states go, aqueous, 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 liquid, like that. So now you need to write the total ionic equation. HF is weak, and so it stays together like this. KOH is what? Aqueous? Because uh, it's got potassium in it in group one. So this is K plus plus OH minus. So this stays together because it's weak. And only strong acids dissociate and the weak acids stay together. So then I have a little arrow. And then KF is soluble. So it's K plus plus F minus. And then I have H2O liquid. You don't break up the liquids, the molecular things. Only the strong acids and ionic compounds, soluble ionics, break apart. So what am I getting rid of? Potassium. And everything else stays. Okay. So then you end up with HF, which is aqueous. These are all... plus OH minus, and then that makes F minus plus H2O liquid. All right. Last thing to go over, I think, in this chapter. Yeah, really, because we've already done combustion is um, reactions that evolve gas. So I'm going to make a little table for you, but it actually it says it's table 7.4, and it's on page 209 in the second edition, but 
I think it's page, I think it's table 7.4 in all of them. It's like the book doesn't change that much. We've known about gas forming reactions for about 150, 200 years. It just really doesn't change that much. Okay, so, so here we go. Um, if a reaction produces, okay, if a reaction produces, this gas is formed. That's kind of like, this is the headers of the table, okay? So the reaction produces H2CO3. The reaction will form, right, CO2 gas. And it happens by the decomposition of the H2CO3. So H2CO3 is carbonic acid, right? That's what's in your soda. And when you see the bubbling in your soda, it's the decomposition of the carbonic acid. So those little bubbles that are in your soda ha are uh, carbon dioxide. And you know like when you burp, like soda burps through your nose? <laughs> Guess what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's kind of like you try it when you're a little kid, you're like trying to make soda burps happen through your nose. And then you get older, you're like, it wasn't that cool. But that's the carbonic acid coming up through your nose. <laughs> so it's CO2 actually gas and H2O liquid. But the gas has formed CO2 and you can see it in your soda as it decomposes because of the bubbling of CO2. Uh, another gas that gets formed comes from H2SO3. Okay, so again, you're gonna, we're going to do double replacement reactions that produce these products. If that product gets produced, that decomposes into SO2. What do you think the other product is? H2O. And you can see how H2O and SO2, when you add them together, make uh, H2SO2. Like the formulas add up and give you that. Another one, NH4OH. That's going to be um, NH3. And the other product is? If I take NH3 out of NH4OH, it's H2O again. So this is the common theme for three of them. There's, there's only, there's four of them, but the common theme is you get water that, that breaks apart and it gives you this other molecular compound, which is a gas. So NH3 is a gas, that's ammonia gas. The last one is actually H2S. And just by itself, this is a gas. So you don't need a reaction for that one. That's the rotten egg smell that you smell sometimes. I smell a rotten egg. It's hydrogen sulfide gas sometimes. Sometimes it's actually SO3 gas or SO2 gas. So what does this look like, right? I'm just going to draw one over here. I'm going to write a reaction. Uh, H, uh, let's do H, C, Two H three O two. This is acetic acid plus um, sodium carbonate. The products are if you do the double replacement, I have H plus. And I have C2H3O2 minus. That's not an acid we've talked about, so I'm just telling you that's what it is. But that's uh, acetic acid. Oh, sorry, I don't need a plus sign in there. And the sodium carbonate gives me sodium ions. 
and carbonate ions. So my products are sodium acetate and hydrogen carbonate or carbonic acid. If I just I put them together. So I have NaC2H3O2 plus H2CO3, like that. Um, this does need a little help in balancing, so I'm going to put a 2 here and a 2 here, just to have it balanced with you guys. That's the reaction. Now here's the thing. You notice like in this reaction, I made that. Uh, and I, I, it just fortuitously ended up being right next to that thing on the table, right? If you form that in the reaction, then what you end up doing is the, the final reaction that you write is 2HC2H3O2 plus Na2CO3 makes 2NAC2H3O2 and CO2 and water. And these are all aqueous. This is a gas and this is a liquid. So for reactions that evolve a gas, it's a double replacement reaction where one of the products is represented by one of these here, right? one of those there. And then when you have that, like you do here, right? you just rewrite it. Oops, wow. You rewrite it like it is here. And so that's how you end up with this final reaction. It's going to take some practice. It's more of the same stuff, though. Write the reactants, write the ions, predict the products. And then you, in your head, have to be able to recognize H2CO3 or the H2SO3. And once you see that, you rewrite it as a gas. Okay? Any questions? Last thing for today, actually. Then we'll be like, we'll get like more time. I know you're tired. Combustion reactions. We've talked a lot about combustion reactions already. So I'm only going to just make a few notes on it. Um, substance plus oxygen makes heat, right, plus the product. But here's the deal. Combustion is defined as uses oxygen, produces heat. A reaction that uses oxygen produces heat is always called a combustion reaction. So, for example, if I have CH3, um, CH3, and I react it with oxygen, that'll most likely be a combustion reaction. And the products of a combustion reaction are always carbon dioxide and water if you're starting with a hydrocarbon. And then all you're left with is balancing it, and there's no net ionic equations, and it's only a molecular equation that we use. You don't do net ionic or total ionic with these because there's no ions in these reactions. If I give you CH3OH, and I say you react with oxygen for a combustion reaction, what are the products? Carbon dioxide and water. Okay. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's got carbon and hydrogen in it, 
and it could have oxygen in it as well, you'll get CO2 and water. So like C6H12O6 plus O2 makes right, CO2 and water. And here's the other thing. So the products are always the same. And now it's up to you to balance it, right? Products are always the same. It's up to you to balance it. And these reactions always happen. So the predicting, there's no predicting. It's like acid and base. If you have an acid and a base, it reacts. If you have a hydrocarbon and oxygen, it'll react. Okay? So no predicting. The only one you have to do any like hard work on, really, is precipitation reaction, where you have to write all the ions out, and look up whether it's soluble, look at the states, right? That kind of stuff. The other one um, that is important to understand is you can actually burn metals. So I'll do this for you in class today because we're actually you're actually going to do this in class today. You can take magnesium and burn it in air. And when you do that, what happens is you're going to get the metal oxide, which is MgO, and that's the only product that you have. So the, to balance this, you actually it looks like this. And you get a lot of heat. And you'll get to see that because we'll light some magnesium strips up in class. It's just, just for fun. And then you're actually doing an experiment that's not just for fun. But yeah, this, the, the actually burning of magnesium. We'll do some other stuff too. All right. You guys have any questions? That finishes all of Chapter 7 because the last bit in 7 is oxidation reduction reactions, and I'm going to skip those right now because there's a whole chapter on it later, and I'm going to talk about it back then. And then tomorrow we're going to start with chapter 8, and it doesn't look like there's a lot here, but there's a lot here, okay? And that's the last material to be on the exam. I, I, reminders, I put up a practice quiz uh, for the um, nomenclature. And it's one where you actually have to type the answer. So if you get a little bit something wrong, it'll tell you it's wrong. Just look at the answer closely. It's just a spelling thing, usually. And I stole that from somebody. So. All right, see you at noon-ish.